Today we take for granted the abilities of modern crime detection. A hundred years ago, the science of fingerprinting was still relatively new. Computer development was just a dream, and people were able to get by with more criminal activity, especially traveling con artists. During those days, long before Craigslist, there were places where men and women could find romance. Calling themselves matrimonial bureaus, these organizations were known mostly as the Lonely Hearts Clubs, and they flourished throughout the middle of the 20th century. Wealthy widower, the ad read, worth $150,000, has an income from $400 to $2,000 a month. His profession was listed as civil engineer. Own a beautiful 10-room brick home, completely furnished with everything that would make a good woman happy. My wife would have her own car and plenty of spending money. Would have nothing to do but enjoy herself. Many would become suspicious from such an ad running, but there were many who believed, and the letters poured in from lonely widows and spinsters from across the country at a rate of 10 to 20 a day, hoping to meet the man of their dreams. And what they would find would be described as a fat, beady-eyed, flabby little man, squat, pig-eyed, paunchy, with weakened sexual powers, sadistic, cruel, the embodiment of evil, with words of gold. He was a stereotypical monster, an attractive alien from a foreign country, preying on lonely women, and in a scene almost straight out of a horror movie, the angry townspeople soon heard and tried to storm the jail, wanting to see the monster dead. This story begins on November 17th of 1892 in the town of Beerta in the Netherlands. Harm Drenth wasn't a particularly handsome lad, nor was he book smart. He grew up in a small family, nothing particularly noteworthy. His older sister grew up seemingly well adjusted and raised her own family, but the whole family was concerned about Harm. By the age of 18, a criminal career on the streets was well underway, with reports of him being a congenial liar, thief, trespasser, and alcoholic. Worried about him, his family sent him to the United States to work on a farm of a friend of the family's, hoping it would help the boy's behavior. He was accused of abusing the animals on the farm and quit soon after starting, not liking to be told what to do. Within a year, he was arrested for stealing alcohol in 1911. That year, his family joined him in the U.S. and Americanized their names. Harm became Herman. It would change again when he took on a blonde accomplice whom he referred to as his wife, and the two would go on a cross-country crime spree. His new name? Harry G. Powers. He would also use the middle initials as F or P. Harry and his wife would live in a hotel in Madison, Wisconsin, where they would be arrested for vehicle theft. She would help him break out of jail in 1919. By 1921, he had developed an infatuation with a woman named Rose Strickland. She married another man, and he went crazy. He broke into their house and stole some personal items, then unsuccessfully tried to burn the home down. He was arrested and convicted the same year. He was released after only 15 months and dropped out of sight. His short stint in jail only served to educate Harry on a new path to crime, preying on divorced or widowed women. April 16, 1924, under the name Joseph Gildow, he married Alice Province. He served her coffee with sleeping powders and took off with a bunch of her property while she slept. 
She took out a warrant against him, but he was never arrested and moved on to Renton, Minnesota, then to Cambridge, Ohio the following month. As Harry Powers, he was arrested with a wife for grand arsony in Three Ways, Wisconsin. His friends posted bond, and then he and his wife skipped out on the bail. He was arrested again in Mansfield, Ohio, for selling stolen goods in December as Joseph Gildow. Four months later, he was arrested as Joseph Gildow again for stealing money and jewelry from a Miss Lena Fellows who was going to elope with him. The following year, he was arrested for stealing vacuum cleaners from Eureka. Detroit's American Friendship Society was a matrimonial bureau or Lonely Hearts Club, as they referred to him back then, which opened its doors in 1927 and held an immediate attraction for Harry. He met and quickly married Luella Struther, an owner of a farm and grocery store in Quiet Dell, West Virginia. Now, for most, that probably would have been it, but Harry saw a dark potential, and his profile stayed in place, and lonely ladies continued responding. Many women wrote in response to his ad. Postal records later indicated that replies to Powers' Too Good to Be True ad poured in at a rate of 10 to 20 letters per day. While the ad ran, Powers began building. He constructed a special garage and basement at his home in Quietdale with Luella. The letters continued pouring in as the building went up. Though legally married in Clarksburg, Harry traveled widely in search of victims, consoling his unsuspecting wife with reports of his business trips from Boston to Spokane and all points in between. In 1928, Harry gets a job selling Eureka vacuums again, and again he's arrested for stealing them. By 1931, he has a new alias, Cornelius O. Pearson, and has proposed marriage again at least three times that year. Asta Eicher, Dorothy Lemke, and Bessie Storrs. Four years had passed from the time he placed his ad with Detroit's American Friendship Society before a 50-year-old Chicago widow with three young children vanished in July of 1931. Family contacted the police who discovered some love letters which led them to a small property near a West Virginia hamlet called Quiet Dell and to Harry Powers. Harrison County Sheriff Wilford Grimm obtained a search warrant after which the horrors carried out in Quiet Dell quickly began to unfold. Grimm and his deputies found four rooms secreted beneath Powers' new garage and the shadowy damp within the subterranean chamber. They found the small bloody footprint of a child, a burned bank book, and blood-soaked hair and clothing. It would soon become known as the murder farm. Police found jewelry, clothing, and other piles of items that had belonged to the widow and many others. Soon after that, on August the 28th, police dug up four corpses wrapped in burlap sacks and buried in a shallow grave on Powers' property beside the garage. A day later, they found the body of another woman inside the garage. Inside Powers' home, there was a trunk load of correspondence for more than a hundred love-starved widows and spinsters from all over the country. Letters and photos found in the trunk suggested that he had been operating as a love racketeer for more than a decade. A roll of film left in a camera was developed, yielding images of a victim and Powers together. Powers confessed to the five murders after promising marriage, he had driven the widow and her kids from Chicago to his farm in West Virginia. 
he locked them up for a few days, then took them to a room where he had suspended a noose from the rafters. One by one, they were hanged, or gassed, as at least one reported it, and the boy was killed by hammer blows. He confessed, I was permitting little Harry to watch the killing of his mother and the others, but in the middle of it, he let out an awful scream. Powers told police, I was afraid the neighbors would hear it, so I picked up a hammer and let him have it. No more bodies were found, but there was a strong suspicion that Powers had killed before. Asked once how many he had murdered, he shrugged his shoulders and muttered, I don't know. Other women came forth with stories of how Powers had wooed them. One Betsy Stores was due to marry him the very day he was arrested. Other women said they emptied their bank accounts when their mail order bridegroom proposed. As soon as he pocketed their cash, he would vanish, leaving the ladies sadder and wiser, but still alive. Powers would come to be called the Bluebeard of West Virginia and a national media sensation. From the time of his arrest on August 27, 1931, to his execution on March 18, 1932, was less than seven months. He confessed to all five murders, as well as was questioned about the disappearance of a fellow salesman. Then he recanted on his confession. During more questioning, he received injuries to his face, which were attributed to a fall down some stairs while being escorted from his cell. Some people come right out and say it was police brutality into getting a confession. Yet no one seems to question his culpability in the murders. Meanwhile, Luella was being looked into as an accomplice as well. Harry refused to sign any documentation until her name was removed. Oddly, though, statements he made for the reasoning of his romancing other women thinly places the blame on Luella for being a bad wife. When asked one by one how many he'd murdered, he replied, you got me on five. What good would 50 more do? He was suspected of many more, 50 or so, but they wanted to wrap it up fast. They feared waiting any longer would provide time for an insanity plea. The news was hitting the media fast and mobs began forming at the crime scene, jail, and opera house. His trial had to be moved to the Moore Opera House in Clarksburg, West Virginia, just to hold everyone. Initially, he was sent to the Harrison County Jail in Clarksburg, West Virginia. Crowds gathered. Hysteria ensued. On September 20th, thousands of spectators surrounded the Harrison County Jail where Powers was being held and demanded that he be given to the mob. The Clarksburg Fire Department was forced to release teared gas to disperse the crowd. Fears of crowd control and prisoner safety forced them to move him to Moundsville State Prison in Moundsville, West Virginia. Said to be very haunted today, by the way. In the end, he was convicted of all five murders and sentenced to hanging after a five-day trial and remained remorseless throughout most of the trial. The first mass murder this country has ever known, the state demanded nothing less than a verdict carrying with it the death penalty. The jury remained in its rooms an hour and 45 minutes deliberating the fate of the slayer. Cheers came from outside the opera house as the verdict was read. Guilty. Even there at Moundsville, West Virginia, crowds formed outside the prison in a festive, growing bloodlust. Cars lined up for blocks on the day of his execution. According to Dr. W.A. Marsh of Greenlawn, 
near Adamston, who attended the hanging, declared just before the execution took place that he had it from a reliable source that Powers in one statement admitted to the murder of Dudley C. Wade, carpet sweeper salesman, who disappeared so mysteriously May 10th, 1928. Dr. Marsh said he was bound by confidence not to reveal his informant. Powers refused any final words at his execution, but remained silently leering at the press defiantly. Once in the gallows, the initial fall snapped his neck, preventing him from thrashing around. The body swung motionless on the gallows for 11 minutes before being pronounced dead. His widow, Luella, refused his body, so he was buried in a simple grave at the prison. At last, the man, born harm, could do no more. Oh.